Welcome, Lee. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I am so happy to be here. And I'm and I just first of all, first and foremost, I fell in love with you over your name oh. before I even listened to the podcast. So I'm great. Honored. Well, I will thank my my parents for that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I reached out to you because I read your first book when it first came out. When was that? Like 2007 or something? Or when Very was good. Yes. Thank yep. you. Anyway. Was, yeah. So it was forever ago. Um, but I've like sort of kept tabs on you this whole time. And as a subsequent yeah. books come out and you've, I feel like you've written forwards for other books. Like, I feel like I see you everywhere and I've just been like, I don't know, you've just been like taking up little space in my brain. So when I saw you were doing an event with someone I knew, I was like, oh, well, let's try this. <laughs> awesome. Well, and you, listen, we'll talk about that maybe because you're supposed to be interviewing me, but so impressed with the way you've just taken books on and made them, they've always been cool, but like this mantle is passing to your generation of keep reading, which is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I love reading. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I don't know. It's just sort of evolved this way, but. Wait, before I forget. Congrats yes. on selling the memoir. Big Thank deal. You. Very excited. Let me know how I can help. Thank you. That's really nice. Yes, I'm hard at work on that. I've written like 40,000 words first draft, but it's yeah. due in September. So I have to kind of crank it out. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's well, really fun. I'm learning a lot. And good um, for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so how did you tell me about I for people who don't know your story? Yeah. Tell everybody what happened. Tell everybody about Bob and what happened with him and how you decided to write a book and your foundation and just like the whole story, if you don't mind. I am happy to do that. Uh, my husband is a correspondent for ABC News. And 15 years ago, he was, um, well, we've had this, we started, I started marrying a lawyer and then he, it's a long story, but it's all in the book. Uh, we moved to China, got married and moved to China. Tianan, Tiananmen Square happened and Bob spoke Mandarin. So he was out translating and bit the got the journalism bug. He was like, this is what I want to do. He was not a great lawyer because he's the most disorganized <laughs> person in the world. <laughs> so that began a series of moving. You know, when you're a reporter and you want to move to the next level, you move all over the place. Ultimately, in 2006, Bob was named the anchor uh, with El Elizabeth Vargas of World News. And uh, we moved back from London. He'd been doing the weekend anchoring. And so this thing that he'd worked for all of his life um, and, and myself as well um, kind of came true. And six weeks later, he was in Iraq for like the ninth time. He'd been, he'd been embedded for the war and everything else. And a bomb went off like it does almost every day. And he really should be dead. He was, he took shrapnel, you know, to the face. His skull was uh, blasted open. So luckily, thanks to the incredible work of the military and the medics, he was, he was airlifted out of there in the middle of a war zone. And they got his skull off within an hour to save his life. And so began my journey into the world that so many soldiers and airmen and Marines and their spouses, of course, uh, have lived in. So sitting in the hospital in Bethesda Naval, Bob was in a coma for five weeks. And it was, you know, everybody was pretty much telling me this isn't gonna, you know, he will probably never work again. He may not speak, you know, no one really knows. Fast forward to this miracle guy who um, is back reporting today, doing all kinds of things. Is he the, the, would he tell you he's the same person? No, he struggles for words sometimes. And I mean, literally has like a plastic skull on his head, but he's a really, he's a miraculous person. Now, what do we do as moms and spouses when the bad thing happens? Somebody like you and I probably pick up a pen. So my only thing that I could control during this whole thing, because I couldn't unwind the tape, was to just pick up a pen and start writing because that was the only control I had in my day. So that journal fast forward to Bob, you know, starting to get better and coming home. And then people who knew that I was a writer said, would you ever want to write a book? And I was like, well, I have this like 800 page thing. And I was never going to write a memoir. I always wanted to write fiction when I finally got to a period where I thought I could, kids would be old enough and I could write. Um, but it was Bob's doctor who said, all of these young men and women are coming through this hospital with these kinds of injuries and nobody out there in America knows this is happening. That was back in 2006. So you need to write a book about that. And that's what, what in an instant became. Wow. 
Well, that's no pressure or anything to tell that story on behalf of like all those families. Oh my gosh. Um, so what was it like when you first found out? Can you go back there and talk about it for a sec? Like what was that moment? Like when you heard, what was it like going to the hospital? Like what, what was that? What was it like? It, it was very surreal because I got the news in Disney world. I was down there with my kids shooting a TV pilot and I was thought it was a wake up call. It was right exactly at seven o'clock when I'd set up a wake up call. So it was that was super disorienting. And I basically got the call that said he's been injured. He's going into surgery. We don't know if he's going to make it. You need to tell your family as fast as you can, because we've all been holding this news internationally because we want to respect the family. So I just flipped into like what I called in the book general mode. I just went into like, OK, I've got four little chickies. How do I show them that this I can't fall apart? And you know that as a mom, right? You've got all your little ducks behind you and they're watching you. Um, but I literally, I was just saying this the other day to somebody, I physically felt my heart break. Like this is, you know, everything that I've read about you and I listen to you and how much you love your husband and your family. Like Bob was my best friend and I literally just felt it crack. And then I just thought, okay, girl, like pull this together. You got to get them home. You got to get over to Germany and see what's left of him. And you've got to figure this out. Wow. And then well, when we are resilient, we people, we women, especially Zibby, right? We just, we get it done. We'll get it done. We'll fall apart later, but we'll get it yeah. done. Well, in the moment, sometimes there's not really a choice, right? What are you going to do? Just like lay in your bed in Disney World? Like so that was my favorite line. People were always like, I don't know how you did that. I couldn't have done it. I'm like, well, what's the, like Valium and Jack Daniels sounded pretty damn good some days, but that's not going to get me anywhere. I'll just be an addict on the couch. And then, you know, I won't be winning any motherhood awards on that one. For sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so once, so how did you deal? I have a new thing called Moms Don't Have Time to Grieve, which is like a support group and um, a oh. column in this magazine um, that we've started. Not magazine. I don't even know what to call it. Medium publication. Um, and there are so many moms who are going through grief of some kind. And I know it's not grief specifically, but it's also for people who are going through an illness or of a spouse or a loved one because it's that suspension of time when like the regular world keeps spinning forward and and you're like, no, no, I'm in this alternate universe of doctors and hospitals and whatever. And, and time is now take, divided into different chunks and my life is totally different. How do you deal with that when you have kids? I mean, I mean, there is this, you don't have a choice. You have to just get up and go. But um, I don't know. I mean, I know obviously your kids are older now. Is there some, like, what, what about those moms? The, the ones who just don't have time to grieve. No, no, it just, yeah. Just like, what do you, we do as moms? I obviously yeah. there's no choice in some, you have to function, you have to take care of them and you have to get food on the table or whatever. But, um, you know, having lived through this, is there any advice you have like for moms who are going through all of these emotions while also trying to raise their kids and have them not be, you know, I, I think it's a really important question because I think sometimes we try to protect our kids too much. And I think our children need to understand there's some fine balance and we all have to find it as moms between being real with your children and showing them that you are sad, but not blowing sunshine around so that when they do hit their own hard part of the road, and we all will, whether we will all lose parents, we will all struggle somewhere, that they understand that you can be low and then come back up again. So I remember my daughter, who's now 28, was just so, so close to her dad and so worried, so anxious. And she would say to me, you know, is dad going to be okay? Is he going to be the same? And I said, honey, if I told you an answer on that, I would be lying. And I don't ever want to lie to you because I want you to always believe what I have to say. And I don't know the answer, but I believe in my heart that your dad will be okay. And I think I said something like, you know, I believe that, you know, God will make dad. Okay. Like, let's just put it on a higher power for like, let's just throw it out. Let's spray it out there wherever we can. <laughs> and that sort of worked because I wanted her to know that I would always tell her the truth, but that I always left the door open for hope. So I think as moms, we need to find a way to do that. And my grief just leaked out. I was great at crying in the car, great at crying in the shower unexpectedly crying at a Verizon commercial, like some of that crazy stuff. And 
the amount of truth I told the kids about what I thought the future would look like or how I felt that day sort of depended on their ages. So I had, we have a team A and a team B and there's six years difference between my daughter and the twins who are now 21, but they were five at the time, which is amazing. So they were sort of like, daddy has a boo-boo kind of level. And then the other two who were watching the story on CNN before I, I could tell them what happened, which was pretty horrible, had a much greater you know, understanding. I have the same thing, by the way. I have twins and I have a six year gap, but my twins are no old. way. Yeah, I have two sets. The little, well, how old is your oldest? My twins are four. Well, they'll be 14 in a couple of weeks. And my littles are seven and a half, almost eight and, and six. Oh, wow. They're seven, okay, the, so the next one is 17 months apart. Yeah. Wow. So we had the same. I know. Class. I look at your life. I'm like, how is she doing all of this? But I can relate because people used to say that to me. They'd be like, how are you doing all this? But if you want to get something done, give it to a busy mom, right? Yeah, exactly. Also, I've stopped doing like lots of other things. Like I'm, I'm getting help from so many people on so many things, like friends and family and like my daddy. I, I mean, I'm getting lots of help. I have a team for helping with work. I mean, I'm not like doing no, everything. But you're still, you have to think about all this. It's your voice. It's your concept. It's a lot. I'm yeah. proud of you. Thank you. No, I mean, I work around the clock, but I don't feel like it's work. It's so much yeah, fun. Yeah, exactly. So you love it. I have to remind myself to like, you know, stop. <laughs> I have yeah. to like force okay. myself to stop. How great is that though? I that know, you, I know. Here's something you said, and I'm going to make it about you for a second. Um, in your blog, you talked about when you're, you heard that your book was in the window at Barnes and Noble. But the first thing that you said is I grabbed a kid. And I heard that because the hardest thing we moms do is figure out how do we keep our fire lit inside of us and keep something that sustains us because sure as hell isn't motherhood. It's going to be a long time before they have their own children and come back and thank us like I did to my mom. But you figured out how to sustain it and then keep the rail of the mommy thing going too. And that's the biggest trick, I think, in this life for women. Um, I don't know that I would have been able to do it or have the perspective if I hadn't gotten divorced and remarried and have those that time. So I also don't want to like set it up that I am this like super woman and I'm dealing with like, I do have time to breathe every other week. And I credit that with everything. Like I, I remember who I am. I sleep. I like, you know, it's so, I, I don't know. Well, I, I love that you I, said I that. that. Yeah. I love that you said that because none of us are super women and there's so much pressure on us to like pretend that we are. But you're getting it done. How about that? Thank you. Well, I mean, you're like an inspiration, right? Like you're, I mean, to get through, I don't know. It's just how, so when, so, okay. So you're writing to feel better yep. for yourself. You decide to turn it into a book. Tell me about what happened then and then the subsequent books and like how it felt to have the story really public, how to be a writer, how to be a best selling writer. Like, tell me about that whole part and like still with the trauma sort of lurking overhead. Well, probably like you, I just felt compelled to write, but I also was writing for Bob because if he, if he did wake up, he would want to know everything that happened as a reporter and life in a hospital moves so fast. And I was also writing for the kids because I thought if he doesn't make it, I was actually writing our life story. So the book is really a love story in a way. It's a story of a family. It goes back and forth in time from us meeting um, and our life leading up to the event, uh, leading up to his injury. So. There are a lot of fun moments in it and they're all the stories of our life. So it was, it's, in fact, I found the original manuscript the other day and so much is cut out of it as you will find out. Um, I thought that was a turtle. Oh, sorry, it's my dog. Yeah, it's I my love dog. that. Sorry, she's my baby. <laughs> um, and we realized it needed Bob's voice. And when he woke up, he had, he couldn't really write but he had written all these things leading up to it like when he was embedded. And then eventually he was able to dictate to me for his chapters. But the story just poured out of me of everything. And when I turned it into, there was a like a little bit of a, a bidding war, I guess. And when I worked with Random House and Susan Mercandetti was my editor, she just was able to cut away and keep it close to the story, which interestingly enough, I remember people were kind of pissed at the time. They never said it outwardly to me. It was sort of like, well, I wasn't in the book or I was just a sentence or a mention. It's been really fun to go back and look at the original document and see that everybody was in there, but you have to make choices obviously as an editor. So the book stuck to us pretty much and the story of recovery and, and injury and everything that was left 
left on the cutting room floor were a lot of fun things. So that became the next book. So then they came and said, what would you like to write next? And that was a book of memoirs, uh, I mean, of essays rather, that some are funny, some are more serious, just about life, about being a mother, about being a wife, a sister, a girlfriend. And a lot of that was extracted from the parts that had to get cut from this 800 page, whatever it was, vomit, vomitorium of words and stories. <laughs> but that was fun too. That was a happier book. And it was interesting because people will say, I feel like I know everything about you and you know this, but I would think to myself, no, you don't. Cause I, I you know, there is so much that I didn't say, couldn't say, wouldn't want to say. You never want to injure a family member in a book. It's a 15 minutes of fame moment when you publish the book, but it's a lifetime of someone's hurt feelings. Um, so I feel like I did an okay job. Anytime I would put anyone in the book, I would you know, send it to them and make sure that this represented them. And fast forward, so uh, Dan Harris is an ABC reporter. Mm -hmm. and So he wrote the book, 10% Happier. And funniest story ever. We were at, we actually, Bob and I introduced Dan and his wife to each other. We were out to dinner once and Dan was like, thinking about writing this book and it's about was about like getting addicted to drugs and stuff and we were like really bad idea like don't do that for your brand and your image of course the book's a giant bestseller dan's hatched this whole meditation business so he was writing about us in his book and how we introduced him and he was like can i say this about you and he said something like she's a really you know she's a great ribald woman or i'm like let's talk about that adjective i need to select my own adjective so definitely give people the choice to like pick their descriptions or at least look at what you're going to say about them if you're writing a memoir that's a good tip i'll store that away yeah i'm trying not to write about that many people but i was i just wrote one section i was like i should probably send this to this person because <laughs> they're probably not no. even expecting to be in this book so no definitely send it and give them some controls and then you ultimately have the controls but you know, I think people just want to feel like they had a voice somewhere in there. It's true. Very yeah. true. Um, and tell me a little more about what you're doing now and how like all of that led to today, like what happened in between and Ooh, a lot happened. So before Bob got injured, I was starting to do some stuff, some TV stuff. Um, I'd always been a writer, but mostly like magazine articles and other stuff. And then I'd been in marketing communications all my life. So the book, the, our book came out it was one of those, everybody wanted to know what had happened to Bob and we had gone black. And, you know, honestly, that's one of my proud moments as a mom, because I could see early on a lot of messed up people in TV. You know, there's just a lot of ego and everything else. So I, we chose to live out of the city. We chose to like, I didn't really, we didn't do the whole social thing. And I didn't want my children to feel like they were any different just because their dad was on TV. So. I think it was shocking to all of us when this happened and he got injured, just the attention that I was not prepared for that. I know that sounds really stupid and naive, but that was not, that was not my husband. That was a different, you know, sort of person. Um, so we just completely laid low and we laid low because he was still putting his words back together and he was still, you know, learning how to talk again. Like it was a very slow and scary process. And he was missing a skull for three months. Like if I, and I could never touch his head, but if I did, I, I would have, I guess, felt his brain under his skin until that was ready to gross happen. So um, when that, when the book came out, I think there was a lot of curiosity about Bob because we had kept him hidden. Um, we had so many funny moments, Zibby. Like we, he was ended up in a New York rehab hospital, but we had to give him a fake name. So we called him John Steele, like man of steel. Like you can't kill this guy. You <laughs> blow him up, give him a fake head. And, you know, the doctors would be like, okay, John Steele. And Bob would be sitting there like no recognition that that's his name. Many, many funny moments, which somehow I think mostly ended up in the book. But the book came out and it, we went, it went right to number one, I think, because people wanted to know what happened. And so it started with, and these were the days, started with the Oprah appearance. Um, and so that really launched um, sort of a speaking career for, for me and of course for Bob. So a couple more books and I unhinged from some of my marketing clients, moved into this career of that, um, became a contributor on ABC. And then when Gail King started at CBS, got hired to be a contributor there. And then the, the babies went off to college and I thought, what do I want to do now? And I've, and I've been writing other stuff. My novels haven't quite worked. I haven't never leaned completely into it and I will do that someday, but I'm sort of having fun with work. So I keep working on stuff in the background, um, and writing other people's forwards. 
<laughs> and I reignited something that I had done earlier on in my career, which is was communications consulting media training for all different clients, because everything is external communications today, podcasts and webinars, and we're all showing up in this way. And there are tips and tricks to just be better at it, to be more concise, to answer difficult questions, to answer the question that you want. So I have been having so much fun with a lot of different clients from philanthropy to business, to finance, to education, um, to tech, and I'm loving it right now. So I feel like I'm the old lady in the kids hat. Like I work with all these young people and they are keeping me hip on what's happening. And it's really fun. Really oh. fun. So wait, what should I know? I never took like a marketing course on how to be. You are just doing fabulous. And anytime. No, no, I mean, <laughs> in it, you know, no, you're great. It's more, you know, some of it is just body language. And, and we, none of us have torsos and legs today. So there's a different way to show up on the zoom screen. We need to be more animated. We need more emotion, more engagement. But if I were doing a confrontational interview right now, if you were, um, you know, a politician who'd gotten in trouble, you don't know what question I'm about to ask you. Cause I'm just about to tell you, I have a tape of you nude with someone else's husband. And you've been going like this. Cause this is what we do when we tell people that we're listening. So you are just playing right in as I'm talking and I'm setting it up and you're nodding. So just some of those little things we don't think about with body language and words. Hmm. Now most I have to stop nodding. <laughs> you're doing just great. Most people <laughs> over talk. Yes, we say we just keep talking and talking and because we haven't prepared the beautiful piece that we should have said at the front comes at the end. So if we think about our messaging or you're doing your book tour and you're getting ready to do that, I will give you a free session so you oh, can- Oh, amazing. Just... How about that? <laughs> that sounds great. I That's was really- to you. I was, thank you. Yes, I, I will absolutely redeem that. Um, I was asking to benefit everybody listening in case there were like tips and tricks, but yes, I will take it all. I'll take it for me. <laughs> there are a lot of tips and tricks, but it, they're, so, they're so particular to the person, so right. many of them. Yeah, hard to generalize. Yeah. Um, so do you still like write in a journal, like per personal journal diary type of way for yourself? Like, do you still turn to that or not really? I don't. That was, I think my compulsion to make some sense of the thing that made no sense, but I had journaled sort of through life. Um, I go in bursts and if I could not sleep, I would be further along in the writing that I want to do, but I have sort of a novel started and I have a part two to in an instant because everybody always asks, well, what? What's the after part like? Because the book really sort of ends with Bob kind of coming home from the hospital and still putting it back together. And I am really trying to be thoughtful about how you write about the after part because it's so not perfect and it's so filled with warts. Um, and yet it's very human. And we're, we all struggle in relationships about various things. Like nobody's perfect. And I think COVID has laid a lot of that bare for a lot of, a lot of people we see behind the curtain. And I just need to figure out how do you write about that in a way that could give so many people who find themselves, um, you know, in the after part of something, some hope, but also some realism and do it in a way that preserves everybody's dignity. And that's a, that's a big ask. Have you read Love You Hard by Abby Maslin? Love her. She's one of my oh, buds. Oh, good. Okay, great. And I actually, in taking notes to think about this book, went back to Abby's book circled all this stuff that at the time I was like, yes, yes, yes. I felt this, this is so true. And then sent her an email. I was like, God, Abby, it just like, let's talk. Cause we're both, there's just this expectation when someone has an injury um, and it's an internal injury, there's an expectation that everyone says to you, oh, he looks so good, mm -hmm. you know? And you're just thinking, okay, well that just muted my ability to tell you if I'm having a hard day or if I'm sad or if I'm missing something. And she's, it's a beautiful book. And anybody who's ever experienced any kind of loss, it's a, she's a good, really good writer. She is. All right, good. Well, I was going to connect you, but now I don't have to. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Oh gosh. I think there's never been a better time to be a writer. There's so many wonderful outlets for your work. It, the old funnel system, which was really hard to get your agent and do all of that. Um, I think just keep writing. And, and I think the hardest part about being a writer and finishing a book is who are your first readers? Who are the people you turn to that can give you honest feedback? And the hard part about that is if you turn to six different people, you will get six different answers. So somewhere in there, you need to find the one North star that you believe in, but you also need to 
decide what it is that is important to you. And ultimately you have to override. There, my, um, my last book, which is called Those We Love Most is a novel and it started with a phone call I got and I was at a, in Kansas City of all places doing a speech and I'll never forget, I can still see the hotel room and a girlfriend called me and she said, Lee, oh my gosh, in my town, this um, old man just, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't an old man, that was, that was um, my town. She was one town over and a young kid had been in a car early in the morning, um, was not drinking, but there were empty beer cans in his car and a little boy rolled off the sidewalk with his bike and was killed. And she wanted to see if I could talk to the parents. And I said, I, I can't right now, I'm going downstairs to give a, give a talk, but let me do it later. And I thought, I just remember walking down the stairs or the elevator and just thinking all of the lives that rippled out and got hurt from that one thing. And that became the basis for my novel, but it was looking at four different lives and the kind of the secrets that we keep. But the boy had died and the mother went in his room and there was this, she hadn't been able to feel his presence. And then she had this dream sequence, this, this vision of the boy like leaving his room and going, winding around the trees. And it sounds kind of cheesy. And my editor was like, I don't know about this part. And I said, you know, uh, and, and she, she was not a mother, um, fabulous editor. Um, in fact, she has a book coming out. Christine pride with Joe Piazza has a oh, great book. Com they're, coming yeah. on. they're coming on my podcast. Okay. Christine, yeah. like I am hugely a fan of, of Joe's from her podcast. Love that. Yep. But Christine is solid gold. Joe's so she's been on, she's coming back on. I have the book here somewhere. So yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I just read it. It's really good. And anyway, she, she was 10 years younger not a mother. And I said, you know, Christine, I'm going to fight for this segment because this, if you were a mom and your child died, you would want to be visited in a dream and know like that they were okay. Just, I, I need this piece to stay in. And that was the override that we were talking about. I really did just what give you like 20 paragraphs there. Can you believe I reconnected that whole thing to your question? I knew it was but coming. <laughs> and that was the, um, that's the point at the end of the day, you're the boss with your, with your book, with your writing. Love that. Lee, thank you. I could talk to you all day. I feel like you have so much wisdom and experience. And anyway, maybe we can meet for coffee or something. <laughs> maybe we're going to meet for coffee someday. And you're just delightful. And I just, I just, I'm so thrilled you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. And keep being a mom and finding all the ways that we can still be our womanness while we're being our momness. Keep grabbing my kids, <laughs> throwing, them, <laughs> throwing them in Ubers when they should be doing their homework. <laughs> no, those are the memories they're going to remember. I look like some creepy person in the dark here. I'm sorry no, you about do that. Not. You look great. <laughs> Stop I look it. like a predator, but I'll be back <laughs> to predate on you, girl. <laughs> oh, you'll be in my dream sequences and like, no. whatever. No. Okay. All right. Have a great day, Lee. Writing. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. You, you too. Bye bye. Bye bye.